Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to a special edition today. Space for kids, space humanities. We must let our children play and in the midst of their play, may find their passion and in the midst of their passion, they may very well find their purpose. End of quote. Janet, um, can you give credit to the, this person? Yes, it is. The, that quote comes from the book, uh, Creating Innovators, uh, basically creating innovators and inspiring the people that will change the world. Tony Wagner is at Harvard, and it is my favorite co quote and exactly what we're here today to celebrate. We must let children play inside all of their interests and who but knows they may very well find their purpose while they are having fun and exploring what what interests them most. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, you've got, I, I get excited because I am not worried about the future of this world when I listen to all of these great folks. So I hope you'll be inspired as I am every day as I work with some of them. Let me introduce you today to our special guests. Um, many of them, many, many of them. Uh, Mr. Araf Anam Mali, he's logging in from Malaysia today, and Mr. Brian Batello and his brother Sean Batello from the United States, Tabaswini from India, Nathan, I believe, from the US too, Weston from the United States, Christopher from the US, Adia Sumanth, I believe. Uh, India and are also the United States. So today these children have brought something very amazing. Within less than three days, um, they came up with some extremely amazing presentations which they would like to present to the public. So please mindfully comment and join in and participate. If you have any questions, um, please ask them in the thread. The children will uh, try to answer all of your questions um, in the second half of the show. So today you will um, learn about uh, women's crucial role in space and the lunar surface exploration the view of, by, of course, from children, um, kids' journeys on how to become space pioneers. We have many mass presentations and um, uh, also, we have space education and diversity matters. So without further ado, let me also introduce you today to um, my beloved friend and co-moderator, Janet uh, Ivy. She is the CEO and founder of Janet Planet. So she, uh, Janet is also the president of Explore Mars. She's a multiple uh, Emmy Award uh, winner, uh, Ellen Awards, STEM Florida Awards. She has a very long bio. She's a, a professional actor and a just amazing, um, probably one of my favorite um, space educators. So thank you today for being with us. And without further ado, as we are uh, tied on our schedule, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker. So Tapaswini, she is a research and communication intern at the Space Court Foundation a youth ambassador at iGiant, a member of the board of advisor at Etcher, junior ambassador of Jacques Augerie Foundation. She's also an intern at iExperience and the member of the Alliance for Space Development, NSS and AIAA and research volunteer at the Space Foundation. The floor is all yours, Tapaswini. She's going to re uh, um, present something about passion and purpose. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Tapaswini from India, and today I'm going to be talking about ELPIS, which means a lot to me. Um, ELPIS is also known as the Greek uh, spirit of hope, and it was also the name of my very first space settlement project that got me getting involved into space science and where I am today. So curiosity is something that I have been into since my childhood. As a child, I was always curious. I would make parachutes out of plastic bags. I would go up to the second floor and I would you know, throw them and wait and count the amount of time it took for that bag to reach 
stick around. And I would do that for different kinds of bags and just to trying to find out how are all of these different from each other. I would make um, new kinds of rovers with plastic cans and so many things. And I remember my mom shouting in the background, stop this. But I was just so curious about all of these new things. And so I wanted to learn more. Um, in my school, we are often taught about different subjects, but we never had a subject called space science. And I knew that there was something um, called the solar system out there and we are a part of that solar system. We have Earth, we have Mars, we have Jupiter, we have Saturn, so many planets. But uh, in sixth grade, I, I believe, we were told about the Big Bang. And that left me gobsmacked. I thought to myself that if something this massive has happened, there must be so much more out there waiting to be discovered. And maybe, just maybe, we could be the ones going out there and discovering that, you know, finding the new secrets and the mysteries of the universe. And that was the first time I ever thought about space in a way as more than just something that's out there. Um, from, from that day onwards, I started studying uh, in the library. Um, I would go to the library during the break time, to, like during breakfast and lunch, and just kind of find books on space out there. Uh, I took, there was this book, specific book uh, on the moonwalks, and that was just so incredible. Um, I read about propulsion systems. I read about different types of rockets that have been out there. The people who have who have created history, the ones who we look up to today. And that was phenomenal. This, this went on for a few years, uh, I think probably three to four years. And by the time I was in eighth grade, I had studied up so much that I was <clears throat> already immersed, <clears throat> my apologies, I was already immersed in this field of space. And um, it was incredible. So this curiosity led me to understanding so much more. I believe uh, I was in eighth grade when I first heard about a project happening and I wasn't told about it. We had this teacher who was uh, going to ask a few students to get into a team and make a project. And I, I overheard them talking about something called space settlement. I went and I Googled it and it was just so exciting. I went to the teacher and I told her, can I please be a part of this project? And she told me, you are right on time. We are making the teams today. Stay back after school and you can join us. I stayed back, I went up to her and it was actually quite astonishing to see that I was the only girl among 15 other boys. And so I had to pair up with with some of them and we had a group of six people. We started working on the project. We started thinking of what exactly we want out there. And um, my teammates, they were talking to themselves. I did not know them. So they started talking to themselves and uh, I was sitting there by myself. And I remember I told them that if we want this to work, we're gonna have to work together. And as I stood up for myself, I remember they started um, including me, they started listening to me, and that's how we, we started making our very first space settlement. And we named it Elpis. So we named it Elpis because we wanted to be the hope of the future, of the present, you know, telling them that we can go out there and we can achieve this. Having a space settlement near the Earth in the low Earth orbit would be something that, that could be a, a reality. In, in the coming future. And so we, we wanted to be a part of that and we named our settlement Elvis. And uh, I had a little bit of hope about our project and we sent it for the space settlement design competition. And a few weeks later, we, we received the news that we had received an honorable mention from NASA. Um, I was delighted to say the least. And we decided to attend the ISDC conference in Canada that very year. We went there and I had often thought of the space industry as something that only the very, very intelligent could do or only the, the, the few could do. But as I went to the International Space Development Conference and I met so many people there, 
um, I met Miss Janet there and you know they taught me that as long as you have faith in yourself as long as you work hard and as long as you have hope you can achieve anything and it was tremendously incredible to be there um, I, I was I attended a session called uh, Girls in Space and there were three speakers, Ms. Anushay Ansari, Ms. Lorna Jean Edmonds, and Ms. Janet Ivey. And I remember listening to them talk about how incredible it is to have girls in space. Um, I remember them talking about how, how they created, how they started, and how they are doing everything in space. And it was so inspiring for me to see uh, that very day I met them and I talked to them. I talked to Ms. Janet and she told me about about how I could one day be the girl who inspires other girls to be in space. And that, that's how my, my journey into space science began. After that conference, I knew that I was going to pursue this later. And that is what I started to do. Um, up till now, I have been um, trying to design new things, try to build something in space. And last year, I graduated from high school which was 2020. So 2020 saw the pandemic and everything that, everything was unpredictable. We did not know something like this could ever happen, but something incredible along with that was the fact that everything was all the more accessible. The webinars, the conferences, the talks that we once thought were too far to reach, they were, they were there right in front of us and we could be a part of, all of them. So I started working hard, I started taking time, and I started going after my passion. Um, last year, we also had the Humans to Mars Summit, which was equally as incredible. And I, it was so, it was so amazing to see um, so many great speakers, so many great minds talk about what they love. It was truly incredible. Um, I, some of us were, um, some of us had our speeches in, in the Humans to Mars Summit, like uh, Christopher, like myself, like Andrew, and so many other kids. And it was truly phenomenal to be out there, to be able to ask them those questions, to be able to participate in those talks, and to, to, have, to have discussions like, you know, what are we going to do with, with the samples found on Mars, with the rock samples, with everything new that we are finding, everything was all the more accessible. And I'm truly grateful for that. Um, anything and everything that I've learned so far with this short but um, truly special journey of mine is that when you choose hope, anything is possible. And space gives me that hope to work hard and reach out for my dream. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tabasweeney, for uh, this uh, hopeful sharing your uh, passion, purpose, and all of your space plans. It was an awe-inspiring presentation. Our next speaker is, this is a uh, idea old boy from Malaysia, Araf um, Anna Mile. He's an idea old from Malaysia and he's studying in primary school year two. He loves to explore the surface of planet Mars and the lunar surface using his iPad and smartphone telescope UV infrared technology. Uh, one day he would like to travel to the nearby planets and lunar surface. Araf has won several gold awards for his lunar surface exploration and space photography. He's also participated in many space challenges and events organized by NASA, JPL, and ESA. And I know you're also due to present to the Malaysian ministry, your amazing work, uh, which got great support by both of your parents. The floor is yours. Hi all, thank you for having me in this channel. My name is Araf, I'm eight years old and I'm from Malaysia. Today's project is about women's crucial role in space and the lunar surface exploration by kids. The Public Complaints Department and Education Department, Malaysia, contacted us last year. They told us there are no topics in preschools or upper secondary school that touch the shape of the moon's surface. Other countries made similar statements. 
In 2019, my dad and I sent some of our sun discoveries to the International Astronomy Union. They told us they do not endorse kids, they do not endorse observations made by individuals and kid flakers. Many organizations will tell my dad that he is too old. I was not allowed to participate in any space events because I am too small. We are always left out for many space events. This project is about the exploration of planets and the moon surface by kids. You know, I don't ever remember learning about space at school. I don't think we did. Did you? Yeah, we have actually. It's a really interesting topic. But did you learn a lot or was it just like for like one short term? I mean, yeah. do you feel you learned enough about space? No, actually, only like for one week, and it's really important we should learn more about it. And you know what's really funny is that, you know, there's only 10% of all astronauts are females. Why do you think that is? I don't know, maybe because no one's ever thought about equality in the jobs. Do you think girls are kind of, they just don't feel that it's a subject for them? Do you think they're discouraged from it, or...? No, I just don't think that, I, I don't think that, I think that people don't really believe in them as much as they believe in men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is sad. But do you think, do you think the education system should actually put more time into teaching about space? Yes, very much so, because it's a very, it's a very important topic that we should learn about. Well, it is, because, you know, this planet is slowly dying, and, you know, we need to colonize somewhere else, we need to go somewhere else, so it is important. Hi, my name is Priya. I am 14 years old and I am from Malaysia. I'm so interested to know about moon and planet. So now, I love to explore the surface of planet and our nearest moon. I feel it's important to all girls on my age to know more about the surface of planet and surface of landscape of our moon. Hi, my name is Chloe and I'm from Malaysia. My name is Sherlyn and this is my daughter. I believe that it is important for the women to study the planet and the moon because it's for our future. If the man can go to the moon, I believe that the women can do that too. So let's show to the world that whatever man can do, the women also can do. Hi, my name is Sima. I'm Chimamu Yosko from Pilan, Malaysia. It's me from girls like me are given chances to explore more space and moon surface in different way. This will plunge girls into space much faster than we get to explore planetary activities and landscape. I went through the entire education system learning about a round ball which is represented the moon and other planets. By knowing the images, architecture, and landscape in the species and creatures on the lunar surface and other planets, we would be able to invent a relevant materials and other invention on space use. So, knowledge in space science would increase and this would empower a woman in a positive way to travel to the space. Thank you. Regular books in bookshops only display a barren desert on the moon with an astronaut. This is our space photography which began to pick up interesting landscape on the moon using our iPad and UV infrared digital telescope lens. All the girls and boys don't know about this. Primary school exam question papers always display a simple shape of the moon. This is our space and lunar photography. Primary science books always display a simple shape of the moon. This is the moon being taught to girls and boys in schools globally. This is our space this is our space photography which captured some These are regular books in bookshops which only display the basic moon. This is our space photography of the moon surface.
is a school revision online display of the moon and sun. This is our lunar surface photography and video. Our land innovation space photography began to pick up interesting landscape on the moon. These are architecture on Earth and the moon. These are movements at the moon region captured four months apart using our land innovation. We detected new landscape at the lunar surface using our land innovation. This is a high energy light which made contact with the lunar surface detected by using our land innovation. This is architecture on the lunar surface. This is the lunar landscape. For our land innovation exploration of the lunar surface, we had won the gold award at Team 2020 in Malaysia. We have won an international special award in Canada, a gold award and a special award for science innovation and advanced skills in Canada. On 3rd June 2020, the Science Ministry said, the Malaysian Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation congratulates you on the results of the study and having received the gold award at Science Innovation Exhibition t 2020. This ministry strongly supports your efforts in making publications and announcements to strengthen the findings of the study. With my space exploration knowledge, I had won a constellation prize for my space story in Tandy School, Malaysia. My dad taught me how to file for patent and protect the technology. This is my participation in the NASA Space App Challenge and learning to work in a team of adults. My dad, my mom, and Istal Zani. NASA would always give me great advice. This is our team effort, Moon Camp Challenge, participated, participation hosted by Airbus Foundation and European Space Agency. Women play a crucial part to highlight children's abilities in space exploration when the science agencies and media stay silent. 98% of the women in news and media made an effort to highlight my talent in the news. The editors who are usually men usually, usually rejected kids like me. Women are crucial in space exploration for kids. Space scientists Atrai Basu offered opportunities and mentorship. The women at Innova Space help kids like me to highlight our space talents. My mommy is so interested in space exploration and lunar photography, but there is no support for women like my mom. People from media and agent science and space agencies, they always promise to help, but they never show up. Women like my mom are always left out in Asia. Exploring planet Mars, the red planet with our innovative lens. We plan to explore the surface of the red planet in early 2022 when we get bigger equipment and lights. I followed instructions from the Indian Space Research Office to get the Mars Orbiter mission data. 
I have discovered some interesting landscape on the surface of planet Mars. In Malaysia, individuals cannot apply for any space grant. Kids are automatically left out. We will be left out until we become old. Someday, I hope to invent new technologies and I want to go to the moon and planet Mars with my family and friends. The tourism minister, who is a woman, supports space photography by kids. Ministry of Tourism will be hosting space photography exhibition for kids in Malaysia. We invite kids and parents to participate in our exhibition. Kids of all ages, children, parents and single parents, space organizations and school may submit their lunar space photography using their smartphone, iPad and telescopes. This project is about women's crucial role in space and the, ex the lunar surface exploration by kids. The excavation date is from 1st July to 30th September 2021. Location, National Library, Malaysia, 10th floor. For submission of photographs and video, please contact sansaucer at gmail.com. The end. Thank you, Ara. What an awe-inspiring, innovative, creative, and professional presentation you put together. Thank you also to your uh, two collaborating uh, ladies that you included. Thank you so much. And if it wasn't Araf reaching out for this show, um, I think we wouldn't be here together. So thank you for applying to become a speaker here. So wishing you all the success. Um, you have the amazing career ahead of your time showing us what's possible. Um, thank you so much. Our next speaker. And Araf, you need to know that the uh... The direct one of the uh, directors at Firefly Aerospace, upon hearing your speech, says, uh, "Thank you uh, for putting this together." But there are a lot of professionals willing to speak, and I just said we are going to be reaching out to you. So we will do our best to see if we can't get the director of Firefly Aerospace to talk with your friends there in Malaysia. Thank you to Gary Lance for posting that comment. Uh, it means a lot when industry, when we can connect industry with these kids, I'm telling you the future is indeed bright. Thank you, Jenna. So uh, welcome, Mr. Brian Batello and Mr. Sean Batello. Jean Batello, he is eight years old and he wants to be an aerospace engineer. He is gifted with, I like, like how you phrase it, uh, He's gift, you, uh, gifted with dyslexia, which made reading a challenge, but regardless, he surpassed the challenge. He embraces his 3D brain vision, much like Edison, Branson, and Jobs did. Their success convinced him to engineer rockets to send people to space. He studies Spanish and Russian, plays chess, soccer, and swims in his free time. And his older brother, Brian, He hopes to become an astrophysics. He studied al algebra three and started taking college courses. He's interested in the environment and space exploration. He competes in math, Olympiads, plus chess, golf, swims, and enjoys studying philosophy, history, history, and Russian. So the floor is yours. They are going to present their journey to how they became space pioneers. Hello, I am Brian Bartello, and this is my brother. Hello, I am I am Sean. Welcome to a presentation entitled Our Journey to Become Space Pioneers. We hope you enjoy it. First, we want to thank the organizers of Space for Women and this conference focused on kids and space. I am Sean and I am eight, and I hope to become an aerospace engineer like my dad. Confucius said that if you choose a job you love, then you will never work a day in your life. I see that my dad loves a job and he's always loved building projects, Legos and fixing things. So I cannot wait to become an engineer. I have dyslexia. I view it as a gift and not an obstacle. It made it tough for me to learn to read and write. 
I would read Noah's on and write my free as an E. But I study I but I studied and overcome the obstacle. I read about I read about grade level now and help my classmates when they don't know a word. Many of my heroes have dyslexia, like Richard Branson of Galactic Space, Steve Jobs of Apple and Thomas Edison. I always think back to how I overcome this challenge and I know I can do anything I set to my mind. I'm learning Spanish and Russian. We are both homeschooled and we love it. I began to I began to love rockets when we visited Kennedy Space Center. I love watching YouTube videos on space launches and playing Cobra Space Program. Hello, I'm Brian. I am 10 and I hope to become an astrophysicist. I'm taking trigonometry through college and I compete in math competitions. I decided to pursue astrophysics because I love math, astronomy, computer programming, and physics. I am interested in climate change and the environment and how we can develop sustainable alternative rocket and jet fuels. I also like to track stocks that are space related because I'm very interested in the business side of space exploration. I was also inspired to learn about rockets by our visit to the US Air Force Museum and the Kennedy Space Center. We love homeschooling as we study as much philosophy as we do physics and math. And we love discussing and launching rockets with our dad. Through Kerbal Space Program, we have learned about thrust to weight ratios, orbiting, apoapsis and periapsis, the financial side of space exploration, the transfer orbits, delta V, rocket staging, engine efficiencies, and balancing funds for parts with rocket performance and capabilities. Learning about space and studying math and science has given us confidence. Learning about space has given us a sense of purpose and made us hopeful about the future. Even through COVID, we kept a focus on learning. Space inspires me to be better at math and it encourages us to be better communicators in writing and in speaking. It also makes me think of our future contributions to humanity. Our love of space has helped us, helped us through find a community of friends for Jazz Planet. Thank you, any questions? Thank you so much, Sean and Brian, for this amazing presentation. Thank you uh, for uh, showing us the possibilities and uh, sharing all of your passions. It's just amazing and giving credit to your father who has helped you pave the way for this uh, careers. So let's continue with our third speaker today, which is Mr. Nathan Laird. He's a 12 year old Canadian American seventh grade great also homeschool student who hopes to one day become an aerospace engineer you just made uh, the screen share so um nathan is going to present a uh, rocking engines to us today thank the you first course. so today i am going to be talking about um, the basic design, physics, and types of rocket engines. Of course, it's by me. And the, so first we're going to go into the basic physics and design so that we can better understand the different types. So the first part of this is you need your fuel. You need fuel for pretty much any type of engine. And up here you have your fuel and your oxidizer because if you've ever done the science <coughs> trick where you have a candle and you put it underneath a glass, it'll use up all of that oxygen and then it won't be able to breathe anymore and it won't be able to, and the fire will go out, which is why you need fuel and oxidizer, which you can usually, with jet fuel, you get your oxygen from the air. But since it's, since we don't have any air in space, we need fuel 
and oxidizer. This is the main part. This is our, so our fuel needs to go into the combustion chamber. But to do that, we can't use like a motor pump or some sort of normal pump because it's not fast enough. The rate of combustion in most scenarios is too much that you would, your engine would have what's called a flame out and it would stop burning, which would, which is not good if you're thousands of feet in the air because that would be bad if you just started falling all of a sudden. You'd have to try to restart the engine. That might not work. But anyways, so what you what this is the solution that we've come up with as humans is a turbo pump. It's this assembly right here. And it consists of a pre-burner and a turbine. A little bit of fuel and a little bit of oxidizer go into the pre-burner, which is pretty much just a mini rocket engine that doesn't require as high of a fuel ratio, as high of a rate of combustion as a big, as the actual big engine. So as it, it can fire up and spin this turbine, which will then get this, get the pumps spinning really fast, which will just absolutely gush that fuel into the combustion chamber and it's newton's third law which is every op every action has an equal opposite reaction so if you were if you were somehow the size of a tennis ball and you pushed a tennis ball you'd probably get pushed back a bit or if you throw something really hard you'll get like pushed back a bit which is exactly what this is it's chucking out matter a bunch which is pushing it forwards because it has a reaction to the ground. If it's against the ground, it'll go even better because it's pushing against something, but pushing against the air works just as well. And that pre-burner has an exhaust that goes out next to the side of the engine. So now, but hold up before we go on, what about fuel? Because I said that we need fuel but what fuel do we need? There are different types of fuel. There is, the, these are the three most used fuels that are out there that most people, that most space agencies are, are, are using. First, we have the RP-1, which is mostly what NASA uses. They mostly use RP-1, which is a highly refined form of kerosene, which is why for example, this is, I'm going to do it with all three of these. SpaceX, when they land on Mars, they're going to be out of fuel when they land on Mars, or they have a little, very little bit of fuel when they land their starship on Mars. Because they're thinking that they can drill into the ground, get gases from the air, and condense that and make more fuel to get back. And that is a very good idea. And so on and so forth. So the RP-1 is a highly refined form of kerosene and they have big plants that use it and that's not hard to shrink that and it's, and it's hard to shrink that down to a smaller size that you could take with you to get fuel on other planets. So that's why they don't use RP-1, but it is a great launch up, launch back down way that you can get into space. It's a great fuel that we have developed. And then we also have kerosene. This is very simple. Is just a gas that they condense into a liquid and they put it in the rockets. I believe the Saturn V used kerosene before they created RP-1. I think that's what it, yeah. That it used kerosene before they invented RP-1 and methane is what SpaceX is using because it's easy. It's probably, the, it's the easiest one to manufacture on Mars because there is, it's, it's the easiest one. And you also have hydrogen that I forgot to list here, but it, you can do liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. You can do RP-1 and liquid oxygen. You can do kerosene and liquid oxygen. You can do methane, hydrogen. There's a ton of different fuels, but these are the four main ones. I forgot the hydrogen, but those are the four main fuels that you can use. Next, we're gonna do rocket engine types. This is, this is the one from the example. It is a open cycle rocket engine. 
otherwise known as a gas generator. This is the one that you saw in the example. You have your fuel, you have your oxidizer, a little bit of oxidizer and a little bit of fuel go into the pre-burner to make the turbo pump turn and pump fuel into the combustion chamber. And then that the exhaust of the pre-burner goes out beside it. Now, this is one of my favorites, the closed cycle oxidizer rich. It can be also run fuel rich, but pretty much all of the oxidizer or all of the fuel will go into the pre-burner, which will then spin, and then just a little bit of the other one will go in, then creating an oxygen rich fuel that will work, that will, if that it can, that can be ignited with the fuel. So that is one way to do it. And I think it's really cool. This is an example of this is the F1 engine. They had a closed cycle where they created an exhaust to pump the, they created an exhaust. Here it is right here, the purple. And they, I don't remember if it was fuel rich or oxidizer rich, but they shot all of the fuel or all of the oxidizer into the pre-burner, which then ignited spun the turbine, which then pumped the fuel in. So then you have your fuel and your oxidizer rich exhaust, which then combust in the combustion chamber, which then does a, which then has a lot of thrust and pushes you forward. This is, we're getting there. This is the third main type of rocket engine, the closed cycle fuel rich dual shaft. Now, this can be run oxidizer rich, as I said before, but it's fuel rich for the sake of this example. So for this, you have your fuel, you have your oxidizer, you and all of the fuel in this example is going into both pre-burners. There are two different pre-burners. <clears throat> all the fuel is going into two different pre-burners, just a little bit of oxidizer. So then you have a little bit of fuel rich, you have two nozzles which are expending fuel rich exhaust into the combustion chamber. And then you also have oxidizer going into the combustion chamber, which works as a combustion to give your rocket thrust. And now this is my favorite. This, when people think they know about space and they're like, yeah, I know, I know like, a, I, I know stuff about space and like, it's good. I like saying this to people <laughs> if they're like, if they're like discouraging me about space or whatever, I like to say, do, do you know what a full flow stage combustion cycle rocket engine is and how it works? <laughs> Pretty much, it's a closed cycle rocket engine, except all of the oxidizer and a little bit of oxidizer is going into this pre burner, and, uh, and all of the, uh, and the rest of the oxidizer is going into this pre burner. So that you have a fuel rich and an oxidizer rich pre-burner, which creates a really cool looking diagram. That, and so then your fuel rich exhaust and your oxidizer rich exhaust and you put them in the combustion chamber and then they explode out of the nozzle and then create thrust. So if you wanna check me out, I do a bunch of different things on my YouTube channel, Nathan Aerospace on YouTube, just look it up. It's the logo in the background, you'll be able to see it. So. Also, thanks to Everyday Astronaut. He's a very great YouTuber, space YouTuber. He does lives of launches and he does teaching people about space and it's really good. He made all of those diagrams that you saw. Couldn't have done it by myself that good. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you, Nathan, for teaching us the basic physics and design of rocket engines. Uh, we'll make sure we share all of your socials later so people can follow up and uh, learn more about your engineering gifts and talents there. Our next speaker is Mr. Weston Yu from the US. He's an analytical and completely focused. Weston Yu has always immersed himself completely in every discipline. He studied space he has studied with a SpaceX fan ever since his mom introduced him to Tesla's. Weston has already successfully launched several rockets of his own creation. He's looking forward to attending his first space camp this year. So welcome uh, Weston. He's going to pre uh, present to us the first mass presentation today, Mass Percy. The floor is yours. 
Perseverance, Mars 2020 mission. Perseverance is NASA's rover. It's NASA's Mars rover. Launched in July 2020 to search for ancient life on Mars. With the successor to Curiosity, Perseverance will test a number of new technologies. Mars 2020 will launch on a ULA Atlas V at Space Launch Complex 41 in July. Um, Mars 2020 will be, will be launching on a ULA Atlas V at Space Launch Complex 41 in July. If you want to speak up a little bit, Weston, or uh, put the volume up, oh, um, yeah. that'd be amazing. Thank you. Perseverance will land using a risky sky train maneuver only used once before in Curiosity in 2011. Following entry, the parachute and heat shield will separate, revealing the sky train attached to the rover. About two seconds after separation, the sky train's engines will fire, slowing the entry to less than half a meter per second. The rover will then descend on a cable until it hits the ground, at which point the cable will be cut, letting the sky train fly away at a substantial distance before crashing. What I mean by substantial distance is a distance far enough away that it won't that it won't destroy any anything of interest. Um, do you see the slide, the new slide? We can, baby. Yes. Um, it's got a number of scientific technology. It's got a lot of scientific new scientific technologies. Meta, Sherlock Watson, Pixel, Moxie, Rimfax, Mastcam Z, and Supercam. Uh, about Meta, the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer, or Meta, makes weather measurements including wind speed and direction, te temperature and humidity, and also measures the amount and size of dust particles in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, it, it's a it's attached to the mast of the rover, as you can see where my mouse pointer is, and um, it's, and it has, and um, it has two large boom arms sticking out. Each of them looks the same, but they have a lot of different things on to sense things such as wind speed, wind, dire wind direction, um, yeah. Also, air pressure. Um, Sherlock Watson. This is a case of NASA decided they wanted to name this after something, so they just made the acronym and then came up with the name. Um, mounted on the robotic arm, the scanning habitable environments with Raman and luminescence for organics and chemicals, or Sherlock, uses camera spectrometers and the laser to search for organics and minerals that may have been altered by watery environments and maybe signs of past microbial life. In addition to its black and white context camera, Sherlock is assisted by Watson, or the Wide Angle Topographic Sensor for Operations and Engineering, which is a color camera for taking close-up images of rock grains and surface textures. Um, it's, on the, it's on the robotic arm, and then the processor is over here, highlighted in, highlighted in yellow. Um, Pixel, uh, the planetary instrument for X-ray lithochemistry, or Pixel, has a tool called an X-ray spectrometer. It identifies chemical elements at a tiny scale. Pixel also has a camera that takes super close-up pictures of rock and soil textures. You can see features as small as a grain of salt. Together, this information helps scientists look, uh, look for signs of past microbial life on Mars. Um, it's not, it, again, it's mounted on the arm. It weighs about, it weighs about 20 something pounds, 30, 20 or 30 pounds. Um, Moxie, or Mars Oxygen in situ resource utilization experiment, better known as Moxie, will demonstrate a way that future explorers might produce oxygen from the Martian atmosphere for a propellant or for breathing. This is basically on um, the Mars, basically, it's basically a fancy leaf. Um, 
yeah, a fancy electronic leaf. Um, RIMFAX, the radar imager for Mars subsurface experiment known as RIMFAX, uses radar waves to probe the ground under the rover. It's attached back here by the nuclear reactor, and they and they plated it in gold because they need to stop corrosion. Wait. Um, Mast Chem Z is the name of the mast-mounted camera system that equip that is equipped with the zoom function on the Perseverance rover. Mast Chem Z has cameras that can zoom in, focus, and take 3D pictures and video at high speed to allow detailed examination of distant objects. The one on the Curiosity rover was called Mast Chem, and it didn't. And this one is only different because, well, this it's different in a lot of ways, but the main difference is it can zoom in. The Mast um, mass cam on Curiosity was only able to um, was had to be fixed distance. If they wanted to high, if they wanted to get close, they would have to get closer to get a to, um, get, uh, to get a zoom picture. And, and this one's probably my favorite, SuperCam. Um, SuperCam on the Perseverance rover examines rocks and soil with the camera, laser, and spectrometer to seek organic compounds that could be related to past life on Mars. It can identify the chemical and mineral makeup of targets as small as a pencil point from a distance of more than seven meters. Wow. This is what we typically think of as the eye of the rover. And that's, well, that's what basically, like, that's, if, if you see a cartoon drawing, that's, that's where we're going to put the eyes. Um, Ingenuity, so the Ingenuity helicopter, the dibladed helicopter sent on Perseverance to Mars in 2020. Ingenuity will test if it's possible to fly on another planet. Two opposite spinning blades, um, I have no idea why the rest of my text didn't render. But with two opposite spinning blades, the, um, but in at such a high speed that in the thicker Earth atmosphere, it would just shatter the blades because of the air resistance. But in the Mars atmosphere, we don't know if it'll even be able to lift a tiny bit. Um, solar powered, and it weighs about two, and it weighs about two kilograms. Um, it's important because it's a technology demonstration to test powered flight on another world for the first time. It, it hitched a ride to Mars on the Perseverance rover. Once the team finds a suitable helipad location. The rover will be released. The rover will release Ingenuity to perform a series of test flights over a 30 Martian day experimental window beginning sometime in the spring. Um, so it will, the, it's attached under the rover, and the rover will have to use the robot by the um, sample caching system. It will use its robotic arm to, um, to, like, to pull it out from underneath it. It'll then drive away a very long distance so it doesn't get smacked in the face by some spinning blades. Um, for the first flight, the helicopter will take off a few feet from the ground, hover in the air for about 20 to 30 seconds, and land. It'll be a major milestone, the very first powered, powered flight in the extremely thin atmosphere of Mars. After that, the team will attempt additional experimental flights of incrementally farther distance and greater altitude. After the helicopter completes its technology demonstration, the experience will continue its scientific mission. Okay, um, that is the end of the slideshow. Thank you very much, Western, for your in-depth experience and breadth of studies for Percy. Thank you, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, our next speaker, we have uh, two more mass presentations after all of this engineering let's take a deep inhale and enjoy a magic of music on mass presented by adia sumat sumat i was born in pittsburgh pennsylvania i currently live in texas usa i am eight years old and today i am going to talk about music on mars I am a student of Janet Planet Astro Academy. I love playing 
musical instruments, piano and kalimba. I love to travel and see new places. My dream is to become an astronaut and scientist. I also love to paint and draw too. I started taking piano lessons when I was four. I became really interested. When I was six, I attended Girls in Aviation and became interested in space. I also love to make origami paper planes and other objects. I enjoy hearing about other astronauts' experiences. I love to watch launch space launches and get inspired. I painted my dream and got featured in the NASA 2021 calendar. I am playing piano on the red planet. I also wrote an essay about recent Mars Perseverance launch, historical moment for mankind. Never ever give up. The buzz word today is perseverance. You need to persevere to achieve your dreams. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Thank you. You're most welcome, Adia. Thank you so much. Uh, beautiful art you've done. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. This is my underground colony. Super cool, super cool. Thank you for sharing this with us. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Mr. Ander Reynolds. Ander is an 11 year old sixth grader that has dreams of becoming an astronaut. He has attended two different NASA camps and camp of course with uh, Janet, um, Janet's planet. He has been attending daily classes online with Janet Ivy in her science emporium for the past year. He enjoys reading, doing magic, working as a background actor on movies and playing with his pet rabbit, Lunar. So um, share with us, Ander, today, uh, what will we eat on Mars? Hi, my name is Ander Anel, and today I'm going to be talking to you about what we are going to be eating on Mars. Um, I'm 11 years old and I'm in the sixth grade. Um, I love cooking in space a lot, and I got interested in cooking by looking at the TV and seeing these kids around my age on these like cooking game shows, creating these amazing desserts. And for why I love space, well, who doesn't love space? When we get to Mars, we're not exactly going to be able to put a space helmet on a cow and just fly it to the moon, fly it to Mars, and there's not going to be chickens just walking around the surface. So we're going to have to go vegan, which means we're not going to be able to have any meat or animal products like milk, cheese, and eggs we can we'll only be able to eat plants and when we get to mars the there's two ways we can grow our plants the first way is we can either bring our own soil from earth or we can use the martian soil but the main thing that the martian soil is missing is humus and the humus is the dead matter of plants and animals that's sitting in the soil and it gives the soil a lot of nutrients. It's also missing a lot of other key components like silt and clay. And I decided that instead of giving astronauts a diet of pellets and pellets, lettuce and water, I should make them a menu of delicious food that they'd actually like to eat. And that's where I came up with the idea for the Mars Bar, the self-sustainable, no meat Mars restaurant. And I'm going to be using beets a lot because beets are high in vitamin C, fiber, and potassium. They lower blood pressure 
and they increase exercise performance. And all of those things are going to be very important when we get to Mars. So right here, we have the beetball pizza, which is a vegan take on a meatball pizza with soy milk dough, corn cheese, beet meatballs, and your basic marinara sauce. And then there's the beet this burger with beet, flax, parsley, corn, soy, and garlic burger. And then we have the avocado, which is basically an avocado taco. We also have the mushed up pizza with corn cheese, mushrooms, and your basic marinara sauce. We have bread shows, which is a breakfast take on your nachos with salsa, corn, soy milk, cheese, tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, and avocados. And over here we have the soy milk with soy milk yogurt with strawberry and blueberry mix-ins. And then we have your classic oatmeal with fruit or agave mix-ins, soy or almond milk, and cane sugar. Um, and I'm also going to be using agave a lot because agave is a natural sweetener like honey. But the problem with honey is that it comes from bees. And again, there's no animals on Mars. So we can't use honey, but we can use agave because it comes from a plant. And I'm all, and we have the onion rings flying, fried in sunflower oil. And sunflower oil is really good because you can fry stuff in it, like potatoes to make fries, and you can grow sunflowers, which produce the sunflower oil. And then we have the sweet potato fries. And we have tosacados, which are a mix between tostones, a Cuban appetizer of fried plantain chips with an avocado mash on top. And avocados are really nutrient dense and delicious. So they're good to put on stuff. And for the sides, we have potato wedges, basically fries. We have fruit salad and we have some rice and beans. And then for the drinks, we have the red, white and blue smoothie, which has strawberries, blueberries, ginger, agave and soy milk. And then the green machine is a mix of a lot of superfoods, which are very nutrient dense and healthy plants and some other healthy things like flax. And it consists of lime, green grapes, watermelon, kiwi, flax, and soy milk. And the solid rocket smoothie, aptly named after the solid rocket boosters on the sides of the space shuttle, are supposed is supposed to give you a lot of energy from when you're about to do a long task like changing the oxygen filters. It consists of green tea, ginseng, elderberry, acai berry, another superfood, flax, banana, and soy milk. And we have the Janet juice, named after our own Janet Ivy from Janet's Planet, with beets, apples, and watermelon. And we have your classic apple juice, because you can't have a drinks menu if it doesn't have apple juice on it. Thank you for coming, and I hope I made you all hungry. You did, you did. I will certainly, as a nutritionist, I approve your uh, mass menu. So let's hope to have you in the future as our chef. Our next speaker is Christopher. Christopher, he's an American actor and is an ambassador for positivity. Love that. Uh, he can be seen in several space-related campaigns through Janet's Planet and Explore Mars, advocating for space education. Over the years, Christopher has appeared in editorial print commercials and has briefly ap appeared on NASA TV. In 2021, he will make his first television debut as actor in an upcoming TV series Ultimate Invasion. You just opened the screen, uh, Christoph. I can't read here. Um, 
which will air on Amazon and Amazon Prime shortly. Passionate about the environment and doing social good, Christophe is the founder of Operation Orbit Foundation, in which he uses him platform to educate, edu advocate, and to inspire change. A certified climate speaker and volunteer scientist, Florida Fish and Wildlife, Co Wildlife Conservation Commission Red Tide Task Force, Christopher loves traveling across the globe, skydiving and creating solutions to benefit life on earth and on space. And today he's going to present um, space education, mass and why diversity matters. The floor is yours, Christoph. Space education, Mars and why diversity matters by Christopher L. So, I am an American actor. I'm 12 years old. I'm in the sixth grade. I'm a Gen Twin astronaut a candidate. I'm the founder of Operation Orbit. I'm a citizen scientist. I work with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission for the Red Tide Surveillance Program, where I basically do water samples to see the quality of the water. Space education. Space education is important for several reasons. It helps us to understand our planet better and to come up with solutions that benefit life on Earth for us. We humans are naturally curious. We are driven to explore the unknown, which is vital to the human spirit. Space education provides us with endless opportunities to push our boundaries and to explore limitless unknowns. I have to think that learning about space is a lot of fun. Learning about space gives us the knowledge to solve our mysteries within our whole universe. Mars exploration. It has always been a source of inspiration for explorers and scientists. And now we have reached a new era in space exploration as we continue to make strides towards the first humans uh, to set foot on Mars. Earlier this month, Perseverance landed safely on a red planet and sent us back breathtaking images of Mars. We are gleaning as much as we can from our robotic, robotic marvels about the Martian environment and geology as we continue to look for signs of life. Diversity in space. This brings me to the topic of diversity and why it is so important. The International Space Station is an example that I'm most proud of being it's more than just a laboratory floating in low Earth orbit. To me, it represents the power of diversity and what we humans can accomplish together despite our differences. Furthermore, the ISS is merely a stepping stone, a platform of international collaboration that is preparing us for the trajectory forward beyond the moon and onto Mars and is preparing us for permanent expansion beyond Earth. As we strive to explore farther beyond the challenge of traveling to Mars, we will continue to learn how to live collaboratively, encouraging nations around the world to work together to achieve this common goal. We are all humans and one thing that the space environment has taught us is that we cannot achieve this such bold and great feats alone. The diversity of thought and the contributions that everyone brings despite race, gender, color, nationality, or creed moves humanity towards our enduring goals to explore. In closing, at the young age of 17, Robert Goddard envisioned humans traveling beyond. He eloquently stated, 
I looked forward to fields of the east, imagining how wonderful it would be to make some device with, which had the which had even the possibility of ascending to Mars. He also stated, it is often proved true that the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. Look at this now, curiosity, opportunity, hope, perseverance, ingenuity, the list goes on. We are well on our way. Space friends, my generation will step foot on Mars. That's a declaration, Christopher. I believe you. <laughs> we all believe in you. Every single presentation was just outstanding, a mirror of your great teacher. Now, let me hand the mic straight to Janet. <laughs> and uh, uh, she's going to lead you into the Q&A now. We are so very proud of you. I hope for anyone watching, you understand how indeed bright the future is. And I could not agree more that indeed, uh, indeed, these people will step foot on Mars. They're gonna solve uh, problems, not only in outer space, but uh, here on earth as well. So one of the questions we have in the chat is, and maybe we'll just go around the room so, and we'll take our turns. But if you were old enough to work for the space industry right now in 2021, what changes would you make or what project would you be working on? So I'm going to go to gallery and say, so, uh, so Brian and Sean, what would you, if you were old enough right now, what any changes you would make or what project would you want to be working on? Brian, I'm going to you. Fuels. Say that again. Fuels, which are more efficient, perhaps don't emit as many byproducts which may be harmful to the environment. Per, would this may also in, be helpful on Mars as we don't want to poison the life that we are looking for. Excellent. Christopher, I mean, everybody should get his autograph. He's, he's also brilliant at improv. We have a lot of fun when we get a chance to do that, but Ultimate Invasion is coming. And so you got to watch that show on Amazon Prime. Is there an industry or a change you would make in uh, if you were able to work for a space company right now? Maybe invest, investing in more things that can make it easier for us to get to Mars. Fantastic. All right, uh, Tapa Swinney. What industry or where would you spend your time in 2021? I would really like to create a kind of radiation proof shield that would actually help us in the future missions. Because when we go out there and build the space settlements and habitats, we're gonna be needing radiation protection or something in that. How about you? It's like Weston. What industry would you be working in currently if you were old enough to do so or what changes or what oh, um, you should you be working on? Prob I well I'd probably but um probably be doing um I think the Mars Mars mission. Um, Mars Mars crew Mars ast Mars crew, Mars astronauts. I think we have the moon to Mars crew here. Arav, if you were old enough, what where would you be working? On the moon, going to the moon, getting people to the moon, what would you be doing? I want to go in the moon and bring my own family. <laughs> Will you, can I hitch a ride with you and your family? I want to go as well. Adia, <laughs> any, any uh, things that you would currently be working on? What would be the thing you would put your time and attention to? Adia? Yes. What, if you could, if you were old enough right now, what, what industry or what part of the a uh, project in space would you be working on or what changes would you want to make to the space programs? I would want it to make healthier on Mars, on living on Mars, so it's easier for people to live. Excellent. Ander, coming over to you. Um, so what I would probably do is 
I would probably put more effort into the research of how we're actually gonna like grow the plants on Mars. And then I'd probably hire a five star chef to come work at NASA and make vegan recipes. I love it. Nathan, uh, oh, and I see your hand raised. Anahara, uh, I wanna hear from you. What would you do and where would, where would you spend your time and energy? Well, I, I would like to travel to the moon and learn more about it. So when I grow more bigger, um, like I could be a scientist and, and teach other, other child, children and other people about the, the moon. I would take that class. I'll sign up for it right now, my sweet. Um, Nathan, I have a feeling I think it would be in rockets, but what, what changes would you make or you know, what industry or company would you be working for? My overall plan is to start my own company, Nathan Aerospace over there, NA, that's why it's NA. And I probably will work for somebody else before I get that, but before, but after that, I hope to start my own company. Anyone else want to answer that question that might be in this call? Uh, we did get, let me ask you this. When we talk about, I think this is where the philosophy, talk about if you have opinions about how space is for all of humanity, no matter, as Christopher so beautifully said, I mean, the diversity of everything is critical. It makes things better. It makes things more brilliant and more encompassing. So are there any specific things that you would say to the adults around the world about why we need to make space accessible for everyone? Anybody wanna comment on that? Um. I would probably say um, that people aren't really taking very good care of this planet, so we need to make space more accessible so we have more planets to sort of have a fresh start on. All right, Brian, I see your hand raised. Kind of like how Newton had said, I am here because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Beautiful. All right, anybody else that would say, if we were sitting in front of the, oh yes, Christopher, what would you like to say to the adults in all the space industries and space programs out there? We need to open as many windows as we can so we can learn more about different environments if Earth doesn't work for us. Ah, oh, you guys are so brilliant. Anybody else? Anna Harris, is there anything you want to say? Or Ava, uh, Arav, do you want to, anything you would say to any space people out there, whether it's from NASA, ESA, uh, ISRO, the Australian Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, um, yeah, the United Arab Emirates. I mean, it's like people, it's like countries are going. It's like we've got three countries represented at Mars right now. What would you tell these grown ups? What do you want them to consider? Uh, top of Swinney. The only thing I would say is that diversity brings so many diverse ideas along with it. Just like there was um, a spacecraft that was um, inspired by origami. There's like so much happening. And so with diversity, we have a better scope of finding what's out there. Lovely. We had one other comment. And what would you guys say the benefit uh, this this came from a director at Firefly Aerospace. He says a lot of uh, professionals are willing to speak at schools and to students about bridging that gap between you being a student and your future place in the pipeline. What has it meant to some of you to talk to space experts or be introduced to those? It's like we certainly have tried to do that um, as many times as possible when, when I am teaching you. What does that mean when you get to hear somebody else, a grown up, pursuing a, a career that you are interested in? Any thoughts on that? Adia. Um, I would ask questions and I would stay interested and listen. Fantastic. Who maybe I know, uh, Ander. What did it mean when you got a chance to hear and meet Dr. Don Thomas as a four-time space shuttle astronaut? Um, I mean, it just sort of gives me like 
hope that like anything is possible and you can have the career of your choice if you work for it. And Brian, yesterday you were really impressed by Aaron Shepard, who's coming up with Robotic Mind. Why was that so impactful for you? Well, I figured, I just figured I liked how I was interested by his comment that it's your goals don't, you don't always get to them straight. You sometimes yeah. you encounter turns and loops and Yeah, he was talking about, you know, things aren't always linear. There's a non-linearity to a, a career path. Uh, anybody else? Tapa Swinney, I mean, you now serve as an ambassador or an intern at Space Court. What are you guys discussing there? Because we have to have laws when we go to these places. Uh, anything you want to share about Space Court and your involvement and what they're considering as possibilities when we venture out beyond Earth? Um, we often discuss the the laws that are behind a space exploration, like what what exactly is a space activity, what defines a space activity, and we we find the limitations to certain things. That if an astronaut is going for a spacewalk, what can they do and what can they not? So we are discussing all of those things, and um, one of the main things that I'm really excited about to be working with them is that. We are trying to reach out to as many people as possible. We are opening up socials, Instagram, and we are trying to educate more people about space love because it is something that we, we don't know much about, but something that is going to be very important in the coming time. Fantastic. Guys, I'm going to give you a chance. This is a one sentence, 30 words or less comment. I'm going to go, oh, yes, Anahara. What, what do you have to add to that, dear? Well, I, will, I also want people to try and and try um, to like and protect and, 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 and protect our solar system so we can um, because like it, it's, it's not like we, 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 the, our planet is the only planet. We have to protect our solar system otherwise. What can we do without our planet? This is the only one we've got. You're so right. It's like, and maybe what we learn about how we protect Mars, we can apply that right back to Earth and protect our great, beautiful blue ball a bit better. Brian, I see your hand, dear. Janet? Yes, dear. We have met so many astronauts and people through your show that have overcome obstacles and objectives, and we have learned a lot. So. Thank you, Miss Janet. Uh, you are very, very kind. All right, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a round robin. Think on this for just a minute and then we're gonna close. I'm gonna hand it back to my fantastic friend who invited us all here today to share your thoughts. If you could say anything to anybody out there listening, maybe a student your own age, someone older, someone younger, who maybe is interested in space or why space is important to you or why following their passion, but talk to me a little bit about what you think. And again, just sum it up with like what you want to communicate most to everybody this morning on this beautiful international platform. One sentence, 30 words or less, Think on it just for a moment. What do you want to most communicate to the world right now? Give you a few moments to think. Adi, I will start with you. So we need to um, make sure there's not really pollution going on. We have to take care of our planet, make sure it's clean and safe because it can also kill animals and spread all these bad viruses and things around that is not healthy. Brian. It represents opportunities for our species. Anahara, what do you want to say to the world? I, I want people to stop using um, pollution things and stop using communities that use lots of pollution and try and use electric ones so then we could um, protect our planet from being harmed and we can be sick and and also from this virus um, that we're spreading 
it's people are dying and we need to stop that before even we could die or and anyone else like our friends. Weston, what do you want to share with the world? Yeah, well, um, we just need to get out of our planet or solar systems or galaxy and learn about everything outside because currently we have we really don't know much about outside our solar system because Voyager One hasn't even gotten pat hasn't even hit the Earth cloud. So get out and explore. Anybody else want to say something to the world to all the people listening about? Yes, Christopher. And then Ander. Mentors and role models, we appreciate you. Our generation will step foot on Mars thanks to your continued support. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be heard. Ander. Um, anything is possible. Just try your hardest and you can do anything you want with the world. Arav. Arav. We can share photography with kids to explore space and the moon. That is not shown in books. Thank you. Thank you. We, yes, it's like I hear your battle cry. We have got to develop some books that uh, inspire the ages that you are and speak to your great intelligence. Sean, what do you want to share with the world? Mouse makes us be able to start over and not planet again. I think those are amazing, amazing words, my dear. You're getting comments uh, from so many folks here saying that you all are overflowing with knowledge and talent and uh, uh, they wish you each and every one only the best uh, because they're really delighted they have had a chance to hear, hear from you today. And again, I am so very proud of each of you. And for anybody out there who's watching, if you're a young person, uh, we hope to do this more. We want to do more and more so that, so that when the time comes that we can really, we can really show adults and those who uh, are already planning the future that they have some great folks coming up behind them that they can entrust their dreams and plans to. So with, uh, I truly, we truly believe in you so very much. Nathan, did you have one last comment that you would like to say to the world before I throw it back to our grand host today? Anything? All right. So thank you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Again, I can't. Oh, you do have something to say, Nathan? What's your quote to the world? Not really. I was just waving goodbye. All right. So before we say goodbye, again, thank you to all of you. I'll throw it back. Thank you so much, Space Connect, Space for Women, to, for making this space for kids happen today. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank you for providing this opportunity, Janet. Uh, uh, the students of yours are uh, definitely a mirror of your brilliancy uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, I'm just speechless about and then I'm actually this is a dream for me actually to you know for for us Janet and all, all of this generation right now to hand over the torch knowing that the future is in brilliant hands with your brilliant minds hearts and support that you have from your home, from your mentors. And should you ever need any help, um, you could directly also go and visit uh, the UNUSA Space for Women Network. There's many beautiful women in different categories. You're just one click away from that role model uh, to support you. And whatever we can do, we will do to support you. And uh, it's brilliant to see uh, you know, um, you're taking action on, on, on this big, big moonshots. You know, Nathan is a brilliant space entrepreneur. You're declaring uh, your goals and your dreams. And um, <laughs> you, of course, have brilliant uh, public speaking skills here. So we <laughs> hope we can have you back in some future podcasts and shows. Um, so thank you also to the parents to uh, support it. And throughout this couple of days, um, I'm just impressed about all of this. So thank you very much. And I'd like to invite you also to the next show by Isms, Commons, and Our Space Futures 
when we think long term about our space fair and futures, will there be a time when earthly distinctions will matter less than our shared identity as planetary citizens? That's just a sneak preview. And uh, go ahead and subscribe to the Space for Women show. We are on all socials. Go and visit the UNOSA. Go and visit Janet Academy. Whatever it takes, uh, we are all here to uh, create brilliant futures. Thank you, everyone, and have a beautiful week. Thank you, Miss Janet. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We should, Bye. We should take a, a good picture for you, Lee. Bye. Bye.